If you like this series, check out the Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong merchandise available in the NSI store to support us making more episodes. You may have heard about a study last year proposing a major reshuffling of the dinosaur family tree. You may have even had a similar reaction to my own, which was, wait, they w weren't we pretty sure about these high-level relationships? We can answer that question with another question. How has the traditional Sauriskia ornithischia hypothesis evolved alongside modern systematics? At first, our evidence outstripped our analytical tools to process it. Now it looks like that's flipped. We'll begin in 1870, when Thomas Henry Huxley first diagnosed Ornithoskeleta. Huxley researched what we'd call homologies between the dinosaurian reptiles and birds. Homologies are traits that are congruent across at least two organisms. Huxley saw how all known dinosaurs had bird-like hind limbs, from the ilium to the toes, and he thought this showed a common ancestry. He placed relatives of Megalosaurus, Solidosaurus, and Iguanodon in Dinosauria, relatives of Compsognathus went into the related Compsognathidae, and both of those groups formed Ornithoskeleta, the bird-legged. Ornithoskeleta didn't include sauropods, or at least Cetiosaurus. I'm fairly sure that's because workers considered them crocodile relatives at the time. This will be important later. Other workers thought bird-like hind limbs only reflected the animal's mode of life. They argued Huxley's homologies were convergence, not congruence. Attempting to fit contemporary discoveries into a Linnaean framework was restricting the science. Back then, taxonomic relationships were absolute. They could say, these animals are similar, these animals are not, but they had no way to quantify those relationships. It was up to the researcher's judgment to decide which similarities count. Harry Seeley, in 1887, surveyed existing classifications, including Huxley's. He argued that Dinosauria were not a valid taxon. Instead, he defined two orders, Saurischia and Ornithischia. You may have heard of these. In Saurischia, the pubic bones point forward and run together, and the vertebrae are pneumatized. In Ornithischia, the pubic bones point both forward and backward, parallel to the ischium, and the vertebrae are solid. Seeley argued, differences of pelvic structure have been as persistently inherited as any condition of the vertebrate skeleton. There was no way dinosaurs could have morphed between the two hip plans, so they must have been separate groups, or so the thinking went. It must have been a convincing argument, because by the early 20th century it had become the paradigm. In the 1950s and 60s, we saw Willie Hennig's cladistic methods incorporated into paleontology. Hennig defined evolutionary relationships in relative terms, using three taxon statements. For any three taxa, two of them are more closely related to each other than to the third. We determine this by comparing the states of discrete characters. A character is some feature of an organism. States are two or more forms that feature can take. So a cladistic transcription of Seeley's hypothesis about hip structures might be something like character zero, anterior iliac process, Character 1, shape of the pubis. Character 2, vertebrae, solid or not. We define groups by their shared, derived character states. The ancestral character state is plesiomorphic. It looks like the root of this tree had a lizard-like ilium and pubis and solid vertebrae. The derived character state is apomorphic. In this example, Saurischians have pneumatocyzed vertebrae and Ornithischians have the Ornithischian hip. Such shared apomorphies, which indicate a common ancestor with those apomorphies, are sign apomorphies. In 1974, Robert Backer and Peter Galton disagreed with Seeley and 50 Years of Tradition and resurrected dinosaur monophyly. A group is monophyletic if it includes a common ancestor, all its descendants, and nothing else. Backer and Galton showed that there are dinosaurian synapomorphies not shared by other thesodonts. These are mostly adaptations related to walking with their limbs underneath them, rather than sprawled outwards. They weren't the only Triassic archosaurs to evolve upright limb posture, but the other groups that did didn't evolve avian dinosaur-type joint patterns. The authors consider convergent evolution unlikely. Convergence, or in cladistic terms homoplasy, is when a trait appears in more than one taxon, but it doesn't show that they had a common ancestor with that trait. Homoplasies tend to be, but are not always, function-driven adaptations of a symplesiomorphy. Look at the teeth of basal sauropodomorphs and therizinosaurs compared to ornithischians. Definitely similar, right? 
Dr. Backer thought so, too, and put all of these animals into Phytodinosauria. Or actually, Greg Paul put the Therizinosaurs in there. He argued that herbivory evolved only once in non-avian dinosaurs. We now think Therizinosaurs were derived theropods, which evolved herbivory independently from sauropods, and both of them evolved herbivory separately from Ornithischians. The Phytodinosaurian teeth are both descended from a much less specialized tooth, and they converged because their leaf-like shape happens to be good for processing plants. If this homoplasy business sounds a lot like Seeley's mode of life argument, it is. We'd reached a point where describing more fossils only made the picture murkier. We needed a better way to distinguish homology from homoplasy than the researcher's personal judgment. We needed math. In 1986, Jacques Gauthier published Sauriscian Monophyly and the Origin of Birds. His primary concern was the latter part of that title. He just happened to find the definition of Sauriscia at the time inadequate to his needs. Contemporary thought had theropods as non-sauropod Sauriscians and Sauriscians as non-Ornithischian dinosaurs. In cladistic terms, Sauriscians were stem Ornithischians. This is called paraphyly. You take a monophyletic group, carve out some of its taxa, and give a name to whatever's left over. Put another way, the group has no synapomorphies, which don't also apply to a more inclusive group. Cladists don't consider paraphyletic groups real in the same way monophyletic groups are, so Gautier used phylogenetic analysis to test whether sauropodomorphs and theropods shared a common ancestor. He offered three hypotheses of high-level relationships within Dinosauria. Theropoda and Ornithischia, Ornithischia and Sauropodomorpha, or Theropoda and Sauropodomorpha are the most closely related groups, with the other one off by itself. It's possible to construct a valid tree, actually many valid trees, for all three, so how do we choose between them? For the first or second to be true, ten identical but independent traits would have to evolve in both sauropodomorphs and theropods, whereas for three to be true, only two such homoplasies would exist between sauropodomorphs and ornithischians, there'd be another two between theropods and ornithischians, but meanwhile, all ten traits shared by theropods and sauropodomorphs are now synapomorphies. What we're looking for is the most parsimonious tree. This is the tree with the fewest homoplasies. That is, we want to have as few instances of apomorphies arising as possible. Cladists express this as the length or score of the tree, the total number of character state changes. So the cladogram with the shortest length is the hypothesis best supported by the data. This method is called maximum parsimony, and it is the traditional basis of morphological systematics. All right, so Seeley's topology, with some reworking, survived the reunification of Dinosauria and the advent of the computer. What could possibly unseat such a robust hypothesis? In 2017, Baron, Norman, and Barrett published a study splitting up Sauriscia the other way. They consider theropods the sister taxon to Ornithischians. To do this, they assembled the largest data set of Triassic and early Jurassic dinosauromorphs ever. They coded 456 anatomical characters, though it seems only 404 of them are actually informative for parsimony, in 75 taxa. They were working from specimens spread across the globe, and they often examined them in person. At one point in 2015, Baron was on four different continents inside of a month. All that work was worth it, I suppose, because they recovered 21 unambiguous synapomorphies uniting ornithischians and theropods. So Sauriscia is paraphyletic again. This is another case where adaptations once thought convergent shake out as congruent. Some of them are theropod traits that no one had scored for ornithischians before, others workers had interpreted as ancestral dinosaurian symplesiomorphies. You'll recall that Huxley's Ornithoscelida didn't include sauropodomorphs. Baron et al. resurrected that name. Ornithoscelida lives, maybe. Join us next time, where we'll actually dig into the support for and the problems with this hypothesis. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Check out thensi.org for more information about our Science Institute, and remember to check out this channel's Patreon.